Okay, welcome everyone to this week's webinar sponsored by the Chicago DOE Alliance Center. It's a pleasure to introduce Sergei Budko of Ames Laboratory, who will give today's talk. Sergei's research concerns complex states, emergent phenomena, and superconductivity in intermetallic and metal like compounds. Sergei obtained his PhD from Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology and was a staff scientist at the Institute for High Pressure Research in Troitsk, where I met him in the late uh, 1980s. He was um, a visiting scientist at UCSD and at the University of Houston, among other institutions, uh, becoming a staff scientist at Ames uh, Laboratory in 1999 and a faculty um, member, an adjunct faculty member in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Iowa State in 2004. At Ames, Sergey has been part of a very productive group collaborating with and doing their own elegant experimental work exploring superconductivity and other quantum phases under pressure. And we're delighted that uh, he's here today to tell us about some of his most recent work. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Ross, uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction and uh, for an invitation to give this talk. Uh, right away, I want to apologize to part of the audience uh, precious we will be talking about uh, will be not as high as they usually are in this webinar series, but barely. Before going to science, it was good. with very brief introdu introduction. So uh, our group is Novel Materials and, uh, and Ground States Group at Ames Lab and Iowa State University. What we do, we design this characterize novel materials, often as single crystals, and study if their physical properties, if they are interesting. We have uh, some pressure in our portfolio. We were studying superconductors, Van der Waals materials, uh, ferromagnets, other magnets, did few uh, works on uh, 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 or measurements techniques under pressure. So in this talk, I will uh, I will try to talk about uh, uh, looking for novel ground states or basically we want to watch sometimes we want to watch how magnetic order is born or how it dies. How do you do it? You start with magnetic order system and try to perturb it. We will talk about pressure, but we undo stress substitution magnetic field. So you suppress magnetic order to zero Kelvin, and sometimes something interesting happens. So that's what we're after. We will be watching for new phases of phenomena uh, near uh, zero Kelvin. So, uh, so alternatively, you can start uh, from the other side. Start with non-magnetic material, strongly related. Apply pressure and try to induce magnetic order and see what's happening. So there are two basically textbook pictures related to what I will be talking about. One of them is Donia space diagram. So you have a metallic antiferromagnet with two competing interactions are your interactions which gives you magnetic ordering and on the interaction which gives you screening of your moments. So depending where you are, and this is phase diagram of, oh good, many years ago. Depending where you are, you are either uh, magnetic order winds or condor winds and you are suppressing magnetic order. Now, Right, uh, this, uh, this transition uh, is second order all the way. This is quantum H point. Right here, sometimes interesting things happen. You can have superconductivity here. You can have a uh, strange uh, metal here. You can have Fermi, and often you uh, do Fermi liquid uh, in this part of the phase diagram. If you are talking about uh, traditional 4F heavy ferromagnet compounds, when you apply pressure for serum based, you are moving from left to right in the phase diagram. 
and for ethereum you are moving from right to left and you think about the just the sizes of serum three plus serum four plus ethereum two plus ethereum three plus fine there is a certain uh, textbook picture metallic pheromon so there is a theoretical statement that coupling of magnetization to electronic soft modes that exist in any metal leads to fluctuation induced first order transition. So basically uh, a series of views and supported by many experimental uh, sets of data is that when you are if you suppress magnetic order in metallic ferromagnet, you can have one of the four possibilities. This one, you suppress ferromagnetic order, and then transition becomes first order, and you can observe uh, three rings if you apply field in addition to pressure. Another option would be to go from ferromagnetism to anti-ferromagnetism with its anti-ferromagnetic phase diagram when you apply field. Now, this option uh, aimed to light actually rather recently for uh, for green materials. Uh, so uh, there are cases when uh, it's possible to have a uh, certain order phase transition all the way. For example, if you have non-center symmetric ferromagnet with strong spin orbit coupling. And in this theoretical paper, at least two of such materials were identified. And then uh, uh, you are entering, uh, you, you can open your pen of worm and uh, introduce disorder, but then if everything becomes blurred, and that actually is very, I mean, probably here you will get your spin glass or cluster glass, but at some point because of broadening of, of whatever you measure, it's very hard to follow what's going on. Now, you, you can have multiple interesting uh, uh, phases around this first order phase transition and on the way, giant magnetic alloy effect, marginal Fermi liquid, and so forth and so on. Here, I'll try to uh, discuss two materials under pressure. Lanthanum aluminum germanium 3, which is a ferromagnet with TC around 19 ambient pressure, and ethereum iron 20, which is heavy ferromagnet with rather large gamma of 520 or so, and on the temperature around 30 kilometers. Let's start, oh, before starting, let me acknowledge uh, at least some of the people who basically did all this work. Valentin, in addition to Paul, Valentin and Elena, Lee and Dothara, uh, Sittering work, John and Andreas, uh, collaboration with our STEM person at, at PSI bring, brought uh, interesting information, and you will see it further in the talk. We collaborated with a number of people, and all each started with uh, Shachis and uh, actually with many other people. Now, of these people who at the time were in Ames, only two plus myself are still in Ames, continuing their brilliant years elsewhere. Um, let's go. Lanthanum aluminum germanium thing. So it's seminal, it ambient pressure is ferromagnet, rather anisotropic, effective moment uh, 5.4. Now, if you put uh, uh, this material on a Rhodes Wolfers uh, plot, uh, a ratio is 1.4, which tells you that at least there is some degree of itinerancy in uh, uh, this uh, ferromagnet. Now, uh, before applying pressure, let's look what was done with vanadium substitution. So, a uh, small substitution by, by vanadium uh, decreases, uh, causes decrease of uh, uh, ferromagnetic ordering temperature. But more than that, both saturation moment uh, and effective moment, pure cerium, decrease when you substitute part of the, uh, sorry, pure urnum, decrease when you substitute part of the urnum by vanadium. So it's not just simple dilution of magnetic species, it's uh, more strong perturbation. 
So it does look uh, suitable to study under pressure. So what we did first, uh, we looked at the transport at resistance at different pressures using actually two pressure cells, piston cylinder and modified bridgement with liquid media in both cells, uh, liquid media, of course, at room temperature. Um, so you can follow these transitions. Uh, it's better done in derivatives uh, and you can basically get your phase diagram. Now, I, I need to admit that identification of this phase line from points like as such uh, were basically based on our prejudice of work on uh, uranium cobalt uh, 2 and other uranium binary saturnaries that done elsewhere uh, before, where not just transport but other uh, measurements uh, uh, confirmed that there are two thermal phases. Anyway, here is a phase diagram. So it looks like that there is another phase which uh, is born after you suppress a ferromagnetic phase. And indeed, a transition becomes first order at some pressure. So we did also magnetization, and indeed, uh, ferromagnetic ordering temperature decreases when you apply pressure. Now, there is a US, so these measurements were done in uh, annual cell and moissanite annual cell in speed magnetometer. So there is a usual caveat for such measurements. It's easy to detect only ferromagnetism or superconductivity. So the fact that we don't see this line in these measurements doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It's just not ferro, not superconductivity. But that's probably known for majority of the people in this uh, talk. Let's go further. Uh, uh, with collaboration with our STEM, we did uh, muon uh, as, uh, we did MSR under pressure. So I will be I, I will not go into details of the technique, but basically there are two things we can do. We can look at internal field at non stopping site or stopping sites. Or we can look at a signal from the pressure cell, which grossly speaking uh, is an early pair of how uh, uh, strong global magnetism of the sample is. So you can see that muons stop not just in the sample, but in part of pressure cell. And if the sample is, for example, ferromagnetic, there are three fields going into pressure cell and this uh, muons will, uh, will uh, uh, fill uh, the, the, uh, the field. So uh, let's look at these two plots a little bit more carefully. So for low pressures, let's say for half a GPA, uh, signal from the sample and signal from the cell are uh, in a sense similar. They start at the same uh, or very similar point. So ferromagnetism, fine, we're kind of new this. Let's look at uh, uh, 1.8 GPA. So it's this line. And right here we already see some difference. So one of the differences is that uh, we start to see signal in the sample at temperatures higher and measurably higher signal from uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the pressure cell. Though we see signal from the pressure cell when we're actually using this ferromagnetic line. So here we, uh, we don't have a ferromagnet. Uh, it, we don't have sample as a ferromagnet. And we, if we go even further to 2.3 uh, GPA, so right here, uh, we still see signal from the sample. And what is interesting and really important at base temperature of the internal field, which is earlier of the moment, although, I mean, we need to pay attention at which site known is stopping, is the same as in ferromagnetic state. Here, we just don't see any signal from the sample. So at least this is not along uh, this uh, uh, line, sample is not ferromagnet or ferromagnet. Great, so what does it mean? One of the possibilities is that 
it's this scenario because we do have magnetism after with the first ferromagnetism. So one of the possibilities it's this scenario with the ferromagnetic phase and go to uh, SDW or anti anti ferromagnetism. In territory, there is this computationally based in collaboration with Erning Hosi Zivang and his and their group. Uh, they calculated enthalpy difference delta H, delta H between antiferromagnetic, different antiferromagnetic phases and non magnetic uh, uh, phase. What you can see that already at 2 GPA, uh, the magnetic states are degenerate. So there are several actually things you can see from populations. It would be consistent if the if uh, observed phase is long waves and long wavelengths and spermalities. Uh, it is possible that uh, the value of the ordering of the uh, ordering vector is changing with pressure over temperature. Also, if you look at this part of population, spermial moment doesn't change significantly when you go from ferromagnet to antiferromagnet. And that's what was observed in, in uh, muon spin rotation. Fine, so far, so good. To go even further, we can check if there are the critical rings which exist uh, for this material. Uh, you do the same thing, but it another variable at uh, magnetic field uh, follow uh, resistance or better uh, derivative of resistance at different uh, pressure temperature points, you end up with multiple uh, HT phase diagrams, part of them shown here. You can put them together on three dimensional plot and that's what you will get. So at zero pressure, you have ferromagnetism, that, I mean, kind of ferromagnetism, at least that's what we thought at the time. And then we have uh, two terahertz wings, which extrapolate uh, to uh, terahertz quantum, sorry, to quantum wing its all points at around 25, 30 Tesla. We needed to do extrapolation since we didn't have access to high field. Uh, at this at this work. So as an aside, uh, double wings are not, they are curious and interesting, they are not so uncommon. They were observed at least in uranium germanium two shown here also in the onion zinc two and few other materials. So what is kind of new uh, in uh, studies of quantum uranium germanium two so far, that it's an extension of, of generic uh, phase diagrams for avoided quantum critical points in metallic ferromagnetic system. So not only uh, uh, we have ferromagnetic uh, phase that becomes, as we thought at the time, anti-ferromagnet, but we also have wings. Interesting. Let's go a little bit further. So as a result of these two publications, uh, uh, we can say that this material provides a very clean example of avoided ferromagnetic quantum critical point under pressure. It gives a novel combination of magnetic phase and the critical links. Uh, are we actually done? And uh, we decided that we are not, thanks to existence of Elena Gatti at the time as a postdoc in our world. So there are other important things. Uh, it would be very nice to see thermodynamic signatures of the phase boundaries. And also, despite we tried uh, unsuccessfully initially, it would be nice not only look when structurally of on what is this phase, but, but uh, to get some experimental uh, identification of this phase. Now, why thermodynamic signatures are important? So in many uh, good, well-behaving materials, it doesn't matter what you measure, transport, thermodynamics, whatever, you will have the same phase lines. Some, uh, some features are more clear in one measurement or another, but there is no discrepancy. However, sometimes as an example of uh, iron selenide, uh, there is a profound difference. So, and I will not go any 
<laughs> uh, you will intuit uh, this paper. So in this material, up to P1, which is a pressure when magnetic order appears, whatever you measure, transport thermodynamics, phase lines are exactly the same. However, beyond this point, when there is a super activity in magnetism and leftover substantial phase transitions, uh, transport and thermodynamic measurements for any phase line give you a different position of phase lines. Uh, we thought it was uh, related to fluctuations. Uh, again, please uh, read more if you are interested. So, which thermodynamic probes uh, uh, we will use? First, it's AC calorimeter in piston cylinder cell. Uh, somewhat known, here we were using Cernox thermometer under pressure, which gave us significantly larger temperature range uh, than uh, many previous uh, works where AC calorimeter was uh, done under pressure. Uh, oh, good. Yeah. Uh, so another one is thermal expansion under pressure using strain gauges. Again, I mean, I assume everybody knows it. So a uh, change of resistance of strain gauge is change of length of this net of uh, wires plus change of resistivity, which is unknown. To get rid uh, of this term, either you glue two strain gauges in two different orientations and look at uh, relative change, uh, delta, delta L over L along AB minus delta L over L along C, or you put another known material in the cell and uh, uh, do measurements relative to this known uh, material. So uh, specific heat. Uh, ferromagnetic transition goes down under pressure. And then there are uh, two very clear features that barely change with pressure. Uh, here is the phase diagram or part of it based on specific heat. If you compare the previous phase diagram, you will see that this part is basically the same as before minus uh, this crossover line. However, here there are very clear uh, signatures of two transitions as opposed to one uh, uh, down uh, there. Uh, you can do thermal expansion, and again, you see ferromagnetic transition in both directions. Moreover, you can argue that you are going from uh, judging by shape uh, from a uh, second order phase transition to first order phase transition. If you look at the pressures near uh, the uh, horizontal line, you can see that you can see T1, although feature is rather we, but you don't see T2. Uh, Fine. You can look all together at thermodynamic uh, measurements plus resistance measurements along C, uh, uh, C axis plus Newton's uh, scattering and plus uh, three scattering both at zero pressure very close to it or at 1.9 GPA. And you see the consistency. So for zero pressure, all of these measurements have a feature responding to this ferromagnetic transition and nothing more. At 1.9 GPA, which is uh, somewhere here, specific heat gives you two transitions. Uh, thermal expansion, uh, but in specific heat, you basically don't see ferromagnetic transition. In thermal expansion, you clearly see ferromagnetism and T1 uh, in both orientations. In resistivity, you can see uh, probably, if you want to find them, both T1 and T2, as well as ferromagnetic transition. Uh, in Newton's pattern, you clearly see ferromagnetism, nothing else. And in X-ray, uh, which is basically, uh, again, uh, a thermal expansion, you see ferromagnetic transition. And for 1.9 GPA, you probably uh, see T1, it's beyond uh, the Arabs. Excellent. If you do muons, and this time we decided to do them at higher pressure so that we are sure that we are in the state where there is a new phase. Uh, you can uh, again detect uh, some kind of magnetic order. You can see a difference in damping between these temperatures uh, above uh, T1 line 
and, and temperatures below T1 line and the same uh, with signal from the cell. You can do very specific uh, MSR measurements when you look for eminent magnetization uh, and you can see some remnants, you can see a different damping in zero field and in zero field after uh, uh, six hours at five and 35 hours, so basically here and here, but not at 60, uh, not here. Fine, let's look again, let's compare a data for uh, base zero pressure 0.2 GPA and uh, some and somewhere around two and a half GPA. Uh, so uh, internal field from the uh, measurements. Internal field is some measure of magnetic moment with the earlier of uh, you need to pay attention when you on slopes. So at base temperature, the internal field is uh, very similar. Lambda T transverse relaxation. It's a measure of the width of field distribution. At low temperatures in purely ferromagnetic phase, it's very low. It's borrowed both in a new phase and in ferromagnetic phase at two and a half GPA. Now, measure of magnetic volume, it's a full magnetic volume fraction below T2 here and below ordering temperature here. Uh, now, measure of global sample magnetization. There might be a feature associated with uh, also with, uh, of a TF FM2 here, but again, uh, at lower temperatures, it's flat. It's a uh, flat below uh, TC2 here. Uh, we need to pay attention that the values are measurably different. And then as we discussed thermodynamic transfer, yeah, uh, we need, a le let's, I mean, that's basically what we just discussed. So let's remember two things, that there is a broad field distribution uh, as seen through lambda T from MSR measurements at 2.5 GPA in new, in new phase. And also there is some ferromagnetic component, although maybe a smaller, uh, then at uh, zero or a low pressure uh, below T21. Let's add here uh, scattering data. So X-ray scattering was done in all these uh, points. Important, th important thing here that in X-ray, there were no additional uh, peaks. So all phase transitions are uh, either structural in nature. So Newton diffraction under pressure. As we saw a few slides before, uh, it's very sensitive to ferromagnetic transitions. However, there were no magnetic break pit seen below T1 or T2. So if you analyze uh, what would be the limits to see magnetic break pits, you end up uh, to have relation lengths of 15 nanometers if you have 1.5 mu b uh, uh, magnetic moment, or uh, if you have, or you will not see anything if your magnetic moment is below 0.7 mu b for any long range antifer moment. Now, from a large value of lambda t in MSR at base temperature. This measurement suggests that uh, the, uh, the cluster size is around six nanometers. So combination of uh, saying nothing in, not nothing, saying no additional break peaks in Newton diffraction and large lambda of, uh, large value of lambda t in MSR measurement. The scenario, the picture we have at this point is the following. So we do suppress ferromagnetic order, which we start with second order and it becomes first order at some point. But then we have uh, two new phases, one between T1 and T2, and another is below T2. So at this moment, we think that 
in this gray phase between T1 and T2, we are forming a ferromagnetic, a ferromagnetic light clusters. We, uh, their size increasing, we're getting more and more of them. So below T2, uh, ferromagnetic clusters are formed and on Uring, they're just maybe aligning a little bit more. So we think that uh, this phase, it's not long range and ferromagnetic order, but rather is the phase with uh, ferromagnetic clusters. Now, if this uh, vision is correct, base reiterates the question about potential role of disorder in stoichiometric compounds when you are in vicinity of either a void quantum particle point or in the case of antiferromagnetic quantum particle point. So let's uh, summarize uh, London Perman German in third part. Uh, it offers new complex example of avoided quantum particleity in stoichiometric metallic ferromagnet. It's first example of combination of new magnetic phase and double H L rings near avoided firm, uh, near sorry near ferromagnetic quantum phase transition. Uh, also very possibly versioned ferromagnetic cluster phase after ferromagnetic quantum phase transition. And as I said, disorder, even small disorder might be important. Now, uh, and now would be a good time to ask questions about this materials because I am ready to go to Ethereum uh, Iron 2 Zinc 20. Over and leave questions for the end, whatever, uh, um, uh, whatever uh, people like. Are there questions at this point? I would like to ask a question. Uh, a very, very interesting example, Sergey. Uh, uh, so, what is it? Is it a ferromagnetic cluster phase or is it an incommensurate antiferromagnet above the quantum critical point? Okay. So, if it would be an immensurate antiferromagnet, there will be still uh, uh, additional break peaks seen. Now, they will not be seen if if a magnetic moment is below 0 0.7 uh, mil b. However, if we look at Mercer data, the magnetic field that muon sees is the same uh, at inferior magnetic uh, state and in this new phase. So we don't see good reason to think that we really drop magnetic moment. So very probably it is cluster phase, unless we or somebody else will come with even weirder versions. All right, thank you. I, I have a technical question, brothers. Can I ask? This is Arjun. Yes, please go ahead, Arjun. Uh, I was very impressed with your ability to change pressure and read the pressure so accurately. Can you tell us how you do that? Okay. Uh, so, uh, Change so um, majority. So, if you are talking about phase diagrams where points are very, very part of phase diagrams where points are very, very close to each other, yes. so this is uh, done in a uh, uh, piston cylinder pressure cell. And basically, what you do, you you barely turn uh, your, uh, your nut when you increase or release the pressure. We did measurements both on increase and release the pressure. So do, now, you, read the, do you read the pressure or is so, there a calibration you rely on? So uh, we read the pressure using lead uh, manometer. And I think below 70, below 80 Kelvin, we're basically safe using lead manometer uh, as a pressure gauge. I see. Okay. Because yes, in piston cylinder cell, we do change uh, pressure uh, when we change temperature. But it's, I mean, many people, including ourselves, have data saying, look, it's the end of flat when you are below 100 or below 70. So that's, that's how it was done. Uh, it mm -hmm. was a lot of uh, whittling of, uh, of the uh, nut on, on, on piston cylinder cell. Thank you. Oh, hey, I, uh, should I go further or somebody else wants? There may be some technical questions later, but go ahead. 
Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Um, so, Ethereum are in choosing trend. So, uh, in 07, uh, we uh, discovered the whole family of six closely related Ethereum heavy fermions with uh, six transition metals sitting nearby. Uh, it was very, uh, so on one hand, it was very nice because we were able by changing transition metal, we were able to change properties and you will see it on the next slide. On the other hand, another thing about this series is uh, that, uh, let me actually, let me go through it. Another thing about this series is for Ethereum or for rare earths more globally, zinc atoms are nearest and next nearest neighbors. So it's kind of heavy fermions, but rather uh, diluted. Uh, as I said, uh, by changing transition metal, you can um, uh, have a somewhat different gamma, uh, Zomerfeld coefficient, and different order temperature. Uh, so uh, what we, we, at the time of the start of this project, we were thinking, okay, uh, we have um, Donia space diagram, we're sitting somewhere here in heavy family liquid, uh, let's apply pressure, uh, move and have a, a magnetic transition, and let's see how it happens. Uh, this actually was done for example, for, uh, for Ethereum over 2020, where uh, data were kind of consistent with Donia phase diagram, although there was an additional field induced for the polar phase, but it's additional bonus. Uh, that, this was uh, also done for erodium and iridium, basically by the subset of the same people uh, with a little bit less, I mean, with similar phase diagram. So we know, or uh, literature tells us that for cobalt, erodium, and iridium, you are able to induce ma magnetic order. So what happens if we apply pressure for iron? The only thing we know to start with that we will need higher pressure since when the temperature is higher. So we started with uh, modified region annual cell. Uh, we were watching two things. We were watching it. We, uh, we were measuring uh, resistance or resistivity, if you wish. Uh, we were watching at which point we have T square behavior, and that's uh, Fermi liquid temperature. And we were watching for a efficient uh, when we're at Fermi liquid. So everything was doing just for going just fine. Fermi liquid temperature goes down as per Donia phase diagram. And A efficient in front of T square goes up again, as you would expect for uh, a Donia phase diagram. Now, the only problem uh, was that at 8 GPA, which uh, uh, modified Bayesian animal cell gave us, we were not getting the magnetic order. Then uh, we used uh, diamond animal cell designed by Alex. Uh, Vladimir, oh, sorry, Victor, and I'm not sure I know first name of Mironovich, but by this they find people, which gave us two advantages. One, it's just small enough to put it on top, uh, to put it on quantum design uh, deal for each insert. But another thing, it's also thermally very light. So small cooling power of this guy was enough to pull it down. So what did we get? We, we had pressure runs, we were following uh, maximum in uh, uh, resistivity or actually in, in magnetic part of resistivity. Um, these three runs effectively are the same if you don't pay attention to absolute values of resistance or resistivity. So what happens with this maximum? And now I'm showing sure magnetic part of resistivity is up the subtraction of that of uh, lutetium uh, counterpart, but ambient pressure though. So this maximum, which is usually associated with, it's not a under temperature, but it's a proxy to under temperature, goes down as expected and as consistent with our initial data. So that's how it goes. Then somewhere around 19 GPA or so, uh, this uh, maximum has different uh, shape and width and jumps to different 
temperature it. Fine, is it all? Actually not. In, uh, in two runs which went beyond 19 GPA, we had a step light feature at low temperatures at pressures uh, above uh, 19 or 20 GPA. Uh, this uh, step and loop, uh, the width is actually below one Kelvin, so it is a kind of step light. It, it looks like uh, a signature of a phase trans transition, possibly magnetic transition. It's around one Kelvin, and actually it does not move when you go from, let's say, a 19 GPA to 26 GPA. It stays more or less the same. Now we applied field. What this transition does, it becomes broader and it moves a little bit to higher temperature. So it responds uh, to magnetic field just as ferromagnetic transition would. Uh, there was no uh, measurable uh, temperature states zone. So all three features would look more or less like this on the phase diagram. Where the easing maximum or the easing temperature, which is proxy to on the temperature. Then we have very different brood uh, maximum at higher pressures and more or less at the same pressure range by having what we decided to call a magnetic transition. Now, is there any, is it surprising that as opposed to uh, global terrorism and iridium uh, 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 work done in Japan before, that in this case, we are having ferromagnetic transition. And actually, if you look at broader at the uh, rare earth transition to zinc 20 series, it's not surprising. You can look at gadolinium transition metal to zinc 20 series, and you will see that if your transition metal is from this column, cobalt erodium radium, it's, it's anti ferromagnet. If it's from this column, iron, ruthenium, osmium, it's a uh, ferromagnet. Uh, similarly, if you compare different areas iron to zinc 20 series with different areas oval to zinc 20 series, for all ovals, it's anti ferromagnetic transitions with very low uh, order in temperature. For all irons, uh, it's ferromagnetic transitions with significantly enhanced in comparison with cobalt ferromagnetic temperature. Moreover, there is the gen scaling for uh, ferromagnetic order in temperature. And if you put our data for a turbium, at least it doesn't violate it. It lives where it's supposed to live at one element or so. So basically, we speculate that that's what is happening. Starting with suppressing the temperature. But then at around 19 GPA or so, a feature responding to crystal electric field appears. And, and at the same more or less temperature, pressure independent ferromagnetism appears. So somewhere here or above 19 GPA, ethereum is purely uh, three plus uh, and beha uh, behaves as, uh, you know, three plus uh, not strongly related uh, uh, material would be. So as a in contrast to cobalt to iridium or iridium to uh, uh, members of the family. In the case of ethereum iron 20 under pressure, uh, we have first order quantum uh, phase transition under pressure, not quantum phase point. So actually, if you look at several things together, ethereum iron 20 gives us yet another example of avoided quantum criticality such as uh, the same way uh, cerium titanium germanium 3 does, or lanthanum chromium germanium 3 does, or lanthanum 2 oval, sorry, lanthanum 5 oval 2 germanium 3 does. So it's yet another example of avoided quantum, ferromagnetic quantum point, but here we go first from different direction by applying pressure, and second through first order phase transition directly to ferromagnetic. And I'm getting to the end of the stop. So, what is the sum, uh, the summary and outlook? Uh, we believe that there, there are still 
possible surprises when you study quantum reality, even in uh, metallic magnetic materials. Uh, you, uh, to get more understanding, especially in new complex materials, you are basically start in using a different and multiple implementary techniques. Uh, examples of avoided quantum particularity in metallic ferromagnets appears to be omnipresent as soon as actually one looks at it. And another important thing, probably it's time to remember that we're dealing with uh, real materials. And even if your material is stoichiometry, with a rather different, di a rather decent tripolar of, I don't know, seven, eight, there still might be effects of disorder. And third, uh, yeah, uh, I believe that uh, there are uh, physical problems for any pressure range, including uh, moderate pressures. And that's all I wanted to talk about. Thank you. Thank you, Sergey. Thank you for a very nice talk and uh, this overview. Uh, of I should put my thing this way. <laughs> Great. Yes, uh, these are wonderfully rich phase diagrams full of very interesting physics. So I also fully agree there's a lot to be learned at modest pressures. So questions for Sergey. I already, I already asked one, but I have another one. Go ahead. Uh, um, so, uh, it, so what do we know about the ethereum uh, balance um, under pressure in the iron compound? Okay, uh, simple answer is uh, we don't know anything. So uh, let's start with high temperatures, close to uh, uh, room temperature. It's probably at ambient pressure, it's three plus, uh, although uh, they, uh, there is uh, uh, some, uh, some weirdness because of we're close to stoner idea. Now, uh, at ambient pressure, as we go down in temperature, we start to screen uh, moments and or in another language, probably change words. That's as much as we know. All right, so you, so you expect that under pressure, it becomes more and more mixed balance, is that right? Well, actually, okay. if, I, if I take seriously what I just said, I expect it will become more and more, no, no, I expect that at higher pressures, at low temperatures, I will get less, less, and less screening. And at 19 GPA, I will get to uh, uh, three plus, which is just as a stone, just three plus at any in any temperature range. Now, this what I expect, stipulating what will what we saw. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Emily has a question. Would you like to ask it? You can just unmute yourself. The question is, uh, in the yttrium-based system, uh, does the valence change under pressure? Yeah, I, in a sense, I kind of answered that we, we don't have experimental evidence. Uh, no, I, I think it would be very, very interesting to do um, one of the setting techniques in diamond and will sell at low temperatures uh, to uh, exhaust, uh, for example, if it's if it can be done to look at valence. Yeah, yeah. Zane's measurements are certainly doable in this pressure range, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, and also infrared will reveal the um, local charge, uh, whether it's three plus or disproportionated or whatever, and also a developing druda or not. Uh, Janice, are you willing to collaborate with us and do this measurement? <laughs> it's a really hard measurement, but yes, I'm exactly. thinking about it during your talk. I have to think more. Exactly. But I would love it. Okay. Well, we have a beamline that's available for that. Precisely. In fact, um, I just got back from there and they're starting to take users and it's great. Okay, well, um, it would be nice if you think a little bit about it and, and go for it. Great. 
Russ, may I make a comment? Go ahead. Um, I, I think of this material not in the mixed valent limit, but really in the condo limit, where, as Sergey said, at high temperatures, at ambient pressure, it's trivalent. And then it condo screens the trivalent moment, which really is not falling in the language of valence changing. You're dynamically screening a moment. And we go from ambient pressure, room temperature being trivalent to mm -hmm. high pressure, low temperature, it being trivalent. So I, I, I don't think this is going to be a system where you see a valence of mm -hmm. 2.5 or 2.6 at any temperature or pressure. Now, I'm saying that without evidence, but I, I think you know, what we were able to show with the original six iterbium heavy fermions is these really are almost as close to single ion heavy fermions as you can get, because it's one out of 23 atoms is a terbium, and they're encased in these zinc coatings. So again, I don't think mixed valency yeah. is... That's a really good point. Um, also, maybe maybe theory can, um, can say something about the issue too. No, uh, also let me uh, very briefly say that I agree with Paul completely now. In old days, there was a kind of mix of language uh, between uh, intermediate valency and, and, uh, and screening of the moments. For example, if you look again in old days, in features uh, in iterbo or serum heavy fermions related to thermal expansion, for example, they were both in heavy fermion, in, in, uh, on the screen, in materials with on the screen mo moments and intermediate valency materials. And some people were using the same language for everything just for simplicity. So, yeah. Okay, thanks uh, Janice and Paul. More questions? I was particularly uh, pleased to see the calorimetry work done. Uh, can you say a little bit more about the sample size and sort of the limits in terms of sample size and pressure? This uh, so, a uh, 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 piston uh, cylinder device. So it's piston cylinder device and uh, the uh, pressure limit. I mean, in our case, it was a little bit over two and a half GPA, uh, but this is basically the limit of the device. Yeah. From what we see with uh, Cernox, it doesn't air, it works well uh, up to two and a half GPA and probably it will go further. There is no good reason why wouldn't it. Now, a sample size, Elena was able to work with, uh, so you, you do want to have sample uh, uh, footprint uh, somewhat commensurate with the size of uh, Cernox, um, a bare chip thermometer, which is effectively one by one or one by one and a half millimeters. Sergey, go back to the slide of the uh, setup. Yeah, there are, the problem is uh, there are no dimensions. So let, let me, yeah, let me try. Good. Just a second. Okay, yeah. so uh, yeah, uh, so two and a half millimeters is more or less what we have uh, in 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 the uh, free space in the cell. Uh, so sample is a thin, uh, one by one, one by one and a half. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Uh, and we were able uh, for different materials for a number of materials were at least up to 150 with a reasonable resolution. There is no reason uh, not to uh, uh, measure higher. And for the neutron scattering, what kind of device did you use for that? Oh, good. For neutrons, there were different devices used for different pressure ranges. So piston cylinder device to uh, one, uh, 1.8 GPA, uh, then uh, there was um, uh, the device that uh, Yoshi Uwato uh, designed, uh, palm uh, uh, pressure cell. 
uh, that was, uh, uh, yeah, that was for the whole uh, range used here, but also uh, diamond anvil cell uh, in uh, OH was used. Oh, really? Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, more questions? Russ, one more comment since Sergey has this up. Um, Elena, who I think is still online also, was able to show that you could measure, for example, europium compounds and, and, and lead, so superconductivity in lead or a local moment in europium, and we could get semi-quantitative entropy even uh, mm -hmm. in the sense of sort of 80% worth. So it was really quite a nice uh, uh, piece of work that brought semi-quantitative specific heat over a fairly wide pressure and temperature range. Well, that's great to hear. I think there's a lot that can be done with other systems, you know, even up to say three GPA. I think that's terrific. Okay, well, thank you very much, Sergey, And thank you for the comments, Paul, a terrific talk. Uh, thank you for all who had time to sit and listen. Okay. And thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next week. Oh, God. <laughs>